My name is Laura Snow, and I'm a member of the board of this congregation. Welcome to everyone. Our mission statement reads, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of Elkhart is a welcoming community, encouraging religious freedom, nurturing individual spiritual and ethical growth, celebrating diversity and promoting a just and sustainable world. If you would like to learn more about this fellowship, please look at our website at uufe.org and join us after the service for coffee hour and hopefully lots of conversation. For listening enjoyment for everyone, we ask that you please turn off your cell phones at this point. And if you need hearing assistance, please see our, our lovely tech crew at the back for um, help with that. Thank you. We ring the gong three times, once for those who came before us and made a place for us. Once for those who are here now. And once for those who will come after and build on the dream. We light the candle this morning, possibly in many different moods, attitudes, feelings, and states of mind. Let us look at its light to draw us together and prepare our hearts and minds for this time we now share with each other. May the light of this candle lead us through the dark passages of doubt and misunderstanding we often experience with each other. May the heat of this candle burn through our differences and attract us to our commonalities and shared values. May this candle burn with the passion and desire each of us have for a peaceful and healthy world in which to live and have our being. And may this candle symbolize our commitment to come together in a quest for unity and what that means for, and what that means and for gratitude when glimpses of that reality do actually shine through. As Mariana and I shared with each other about her message, what it was going to be all about and what we talked about, putting the service together, I suddenly realized, at least for me, what goes into a quest or search for unity in community among individuals, for oneness in purpose, or for at least an understanding of what contributes to building that reality. As we gather from Sunday to Sunday, combining many relationships between many different people, I believe that if we allow those differences to be put into one big blender, like this gathering place, some form of unity could result. I like to call it maybe a faith milkshake. <laughs> For you see, we are all so different in many ways that it seems sometimes impossible to even realize what our being one could look like. But what I've begun to realize is the fact that the environment <clears throat> that the Unitarian Universal's Fellowship of Elkhart provides is exactly the petri dish that allows differences to grow into one, to be united in ways not possible in the churches and fellowships in which many of us grew up. What I'm going to share with you this morning was written in 2011. I was a facilitator for small group meetings that we called Circles of Trust. 
small groups of individuals committed to developing together a level of trust in each other that cannot be found in intersections and experiences of our daily lives. Another discovery in preparing for today's service is that I wrote these words not realizing <clears throat> that it would be 12 years before I would have a more full understanding of what I was trying to say. The writing I will share with you means so much more to me today <clears throat> as a UU member than it did as a member of that small group in the Church of the Brethren. I can only hope you grasp a little of what I am talking about as you think about your own spiritual journeys and quests for that oneness we all might be seeking. I titled this, My, Thir My Soul is Thirsty. I have been invited to drink. The choice is mine. How do I drink? Do I sip? Do I gulp? Do I decline? No, I choose to drink. I believe I drink my very being. From without, it flows inside and through me and out again, moment after moment, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, and year after year. A never-ending process that will continue until I can drink no more. Mine is not to question how long I drink, but that I must drink. It is my life. As I drink, I never forget the source of my being. I never forget the value and gift of simply being able to drink. I never forget that I am not alone. I never forget that I must share my drink with others. And in that sharing, my life becomes complete, whole, worth living. And the more I drink and share, the thirstier I get. I cannot consume or drink the universe, which is beyond me, but of which I am connected. I can only drink one swallow at a time, knowing that I have eternity to drink the universe. I am not given much time to drink, which means it all the more important to keep drinking, never forgetting that, is, that this is my only chance. Only I cannot drink, once I cannot drink anymore, or when I have failed to drink, I will not have those opportunities again. But what happens the moment I finish drinking and can drink no more? Is it a big black hole that I imagined as a 10-year-old child? Or is it an infinite source of life and energy and beauty and well-being and never-ending friendship, love and joy and affirmation? I believe so. If I could imagine the best tasting drink I have ever tasted or if I could take the, t uh, the best tasting drink <clears throat> I could ever wish for or able to be able to drink, the drink I would receive when I am finished drinking is beyond my ma imagination. It is far better that I can comprehend. It is more than I could even ever put on paper. It is far better than I could ever make. It is beyond me and not to question, but to hope for and to know is mine. The drink of which I speak is never ending. It is from an eternal source that I will finally understand when I have drunk my last swallow, only to begin the biggest and best drink of all. That drink will contain drinks of all that have gone before me and all that will follow. How can I understand this? I can't. I can only wonder what it will taste like and know that that's when the mystery will be revealed. What a glorious drink that will be, the drink of all drinks. And I forgot to do our unison covenant. Let's do that now, please. Love is the spirit of this church, and service is its law. To dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. This is our covenant. Hymn number 1031, we've sung once before, and we have Marva here to help us this time. It's very simple, so we're gonna, she's gonna play it through once, and then we will sing it twice. Um, you'll notice the words go from may I be filled to may you be filled, 
and to may we be filled are the three verses. Stand and sing if you're willing and able. This is the time in our service when we share with each other the joys and sorrows of our worldwide community. Two weeks ago, we shared the personal ones among our congregation and those close to us. And now we share what we know of what's been happening in the rest of the world, whether on the other side of Elkhart or the other side of the continent or the other side of the hemisphere. This is not an attempt to name everything that's happened or to say, now we've got to solve this one. It's a matter of keeping our awareness up and our hearts open. Thank you. If you have one to share, please speak it and I will repeat it into the mic. For example, I will start us with the deadly wildfires in Maui that we're all aware of. Continuing gun violence last night, the three at the Dollar General store. Yeah, the, the hurricane in, su in Southern California, a word we never wanted to have to hear. Now, yes, yes, Louisiana has wildfires too. Greece. Fires in Greece. conflict and violence in the whole sub-Saharan Africa. Yes, Linda. The killing of the coral reefs. I have a joy. I can't really define it very clearly, but um, I heard about a plant-based filter that can help take plastics out of the water. Um, still working on it, but it's, it's coming. 
And also, many of you probably have heard of the Inflation Reduction Act, which isn't just a brand new thing, but we're learning more about it as um, an offer to help us afford to take some steps to heal the environment. Um, we'll be hearing more about that in an upcoming service. India landing on the moon. William. For all the unjustly imprisoned in all the prisons of the world. For all the unjustly imprisoned in all the prisons in all the world. Yes, Holly. Indiana's public health budget has increased. Thank you for telling me that. May light and warmth come to all those who need and bring it. May we grow in awareness of our global community and bear witness. And may we ever be grateful for all that we have been given. Each week, UUFE splits our plate offering with nonprofits and organizations of, in Elkhart, Elkhart County that uh, have like values as UUFE. Last week, we uh, shared $137. That was for the second week for the Center for Healing and Hope. This week's collection um, will be shared with the Elkhart County Humane Society. We're going to do something a little different for the offering. You can remain seated, but the words will be on the board. Number 402, Marva's going to play it once, and then we'll sing it until the offering is completed. pronounce your name right. I can't roll my R's, but it's Mariana, something like that. I've gotten to know her very well, uh, just getting to the service together, but she was always, her and Hilton were very faithful in the roadside cleanup in the last few years, and we're really looking forward to your message. You have a lot to share about that, how you came to know about that, and we really look forward to you speaking to us, Mariana. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. You probably wonder why am I here? I am wondering why am I here? <laughs> Hilton and I decided in, nine, in the year 2000 to give up his job. We bought a fifth wheel. We had a big truck. We hooked it up. And we went work camping. Now, if you're not familiar with work camping, you can go anywhere in the United States and find some place to work in exchange for a free stay. We only worked two days a week. We got to stay at different places. We mucked, we trimmed. We did anything they want us to do. So 
we ended up in the Rio Grande Valley, Edinburgh, Texas. Well, there again, we're traveling, and you know what really we missed the most was our home, which is the UU is our home. So we started looking around for UU, and yes, there's one in San Juan, UU of Hidalgo County. So we get in our car, we drive down there, and there's an empty lot. The church burned. We went to the police station and said, where's the church? Where is it? Well, you're out of luck. <laughs> we came back the next year, and lo and behold, they had moved a small Baptist little church in our space, and it was lovely. We had a lot of different congregants, and the students from you know, the area, and all kinds of people. So we had Winter, Texas ministers. They came from Normal, Illinois. Ruth and Bill Kennedy, lovely people, went to school with Gordon. So, you know, they were very theatrical, and they presented this lovely um, sermon that was written by Lisa, Reverend Lisa Friedman of the UU Church of Flint. I've carried this with me now for 20 years. The message was so profound that I, it was in my mind, and it was in my mind, and I would reread it. And it's so now, it really fits what's happening now. So I showed Steve, and I said, what do you think? He said, yeah, if you want to read it, I go, well, maybe I will, and maybe I won't, but here I am. Um, everywhere we went, we're camping, we would try to find a UU. The, the most interesting was, was in, one was in Rio, Rancho Mirage in California, and I'm not sure if they didn't get some of the water because it was out in the desert. Beautiful congregation, beautiful choir, beautiful music. All the actors from uh, Palm Springs were there. It was just beautiful. I'm going to start out by reading a poem by Clara Bateman. It's called Childhood of a Stranger. You two once were carried in your sleep. You too, someone a warm weight of breath and cloth, wisps of sleep like slow streams off your seamless face, day distilling into dreams in a skull yet soft. Now we are encrusted and barbed years, flinty, adamantine, ready to repel, all assaults against our independence, but for that hint of honey, trace up down, the secret nerve that never has grown, there is a depth between us even now that our autonomy cannot remove, a bend towards something more than tolerance, older than kindness, oddly akin to love. I'm going to read the sermon now. It's called We Would Be One. Now, if I have a little strange pronunciation of words, English is my second language, just so you know. A butterfly soared through the yard the other day. It looked like it was enjoying a gentle roller coaster ride. A quick, dainty pattern of soaring up and down and up again over the fragrant flowers above the dried grass to a destination that only it knew. Watching it go, it did, seem, it did not seem possible or even plausible that the faint, slight movement of its silken wings could be capable of causing a tornado half a world away. This was the famous example the scientist Edward Lorenz employed to try to get our human minds around the great patterns of cause and effect in which we live. A lovely butterfly could be the origin of a great destructive wind of all, if all the conditions were right. Even a small, fragile being can create an enormous event. Our actions are connected to other actions and chains of events beyond our sight and ken. When we release them into the world, we do not live by and for ourselves alone, nor can we. Instead, we are caught up, whether we choose it or not, in the great independent web of life. Unitarian Universalism is unusual in the religious world in that we have long embraced the idea of unity, 
of existence. While the vast majority of the Christian community divided the Godhead in three equal parts, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. The Unitarian, excuse me, the Unitarians rejected this triad and proclaimed the fundamental unity of the Holy. While other preachers scoffed at the theory that we were the descendants of monkeys and mollusks, weasels and worms, <laughs> we found it at least as reasonable as the alternatives. While theologians debated the literal meanings of establishing tradition and dogma, our transcendentalist forebears sent us back into the woods and the larger circle of nature to discover that fate and wisdom might be revealed amid the trees and the stars. While good citizens worried about the fate of the saved and the unsaved, the universalist brothers and sisters reminded us that we were not, that there was no salvation unless it were for all. Together with those who have gone before us, we have historically fought the impulse to divide humanity from one another or from its connection to the earth itself. I want to lift up this assumption and affirmation of our unity this morning because we have, if anything, taken the belief for granted. It is easy to nod in agreement when we hear the expansive expression of faith written by the Reverend David Williams. When one suffers, we all suffer. When one hungers for bread, we all hunger. When one attains the heart's desire, we all are partners of the joy. But those noble tenets are harder to live by than they might seem. At times when I'm watching a butterfly or a bird in flight, I have to ask myself, do I really believe that this unity, this unfailing connection is true? In reality, I know that I am sometimes happy and the same for another, or sad for an equally good cause. I'm often full of wholesome food, even when, as the news tells me, of starvation in Africa or in my hometown. Sometimes I'm envious, not joyful, as I should be, at another's heart worn success. Are such a sentiment of unity really a fate statement of how the world is, or more, how we wish it should be? Can our own limited hearts and minds, I need a little light, <laughs> okay, comprehend the immensity and the consequences of the creation's web. And if we can, what does it mean to our lives? Just the other day, I had a visit from an exuberant one-year-old. She instantly fell in love with my kitchen when she was not running from corner to corner exploring the secrets. She demanded it she be picked up so that she could view all from every angle. Having declared the room her domain, aha, she seemed puzzled at only one thing. What were those two dogs and the cat doing there? As our animals innocently wandered in and out, intent on having some food and water, Carrie would exclaim and pronounce to them words and hands movement that only she could understand. Finally, in frustration, she decided to pick up the metal doorstop and wave it over their heads. And as we tried to convince her not to drop it on them, I wondered if, in her young mind's eye, she was trying to still, still establish her domain or if she was trying to share it. I still do not know what it was in the moment that she gave up on this plan and propped down, defeated in the center of the floor, that one of the dogs finally came up and gently licked her on the face. Despite the mystery of our birth, we are not born with a wide and expansive view of the web in which we live. Instead, we uncover the connections thread by thread. As we go about our daily living, sometimes the connections are obvious, and sometimes all the more surprising in their subtlety. But whether we are intently taught to value and respect these connections, or fated to simply stumble upon them in our own, 
I think that we are often intimidated by what we find there in the larger version. We shy away from it, and in doing so, we shy away from the very heart of the, the theology request. The word theologi the yeah, theology literally means the study of God. I choose to interpret it more broadly to simply the study of the great life force which may or may not have conscient consciousness, but which nevertheless can be found in the orbit of the stars, the flows of the rivers, and the beating of a newborn's heart. Theology, put another way, is the study of the wholeness of creation, the unity that we so often try to deny because we are afraid of the responsibilities and the consequences. Consider the study which recently responded, reported that over 25% of the American people believe that Satan is real. 25% hmm. of our nation believes that the impulse towards evil and destruction is literally embodied in a supernatural being, a trickster spirit who plays on the base of human passions to lead us down a less than admirable path. In a sense, this can be rather confusing, believe, comforting to believe, excuse me, for if Satan exists outside of us, a separate and ancient personage, then we can distance ourselves from him, ward him off out of our homes and hearts with prayers and righteousness and declare him something wholly other than our own. But what if we attest to believe to the unity of all creation? Suddenly then, evil becomes a reality that has a place in the web of, as well. It is a mere, it is a more uneasy picture for now, evil becomes something that we innately have connection with, even if our lives and far from immortal and kernel. So if we are to affirm our unity with all creation, even the impulse to destruction and self-contented ambition, if we are to assume that rich and poor, wise and simple, strong and feeble, we are joined together by a mystic connection, then our theology would teach us a healthy humility. We might be far less likely to name others as our scapegoats, or we get caught up prizing ourselves for our own more moral worth. Out of our humility, we might learn to fight evil as something that we can and lies within us, as well as without. And thus learn to focus on resistance and battle where we can most make a difference. Yes, it can be an agonizing thought, but only if we understand that we are capable of can we begin to choose a wiser way or consider the famous dilemma of Satyr's play, No Exit, which describes hell as three people who have nothing in common, locked in a room together. It is not that they are particularly bad or mean people, but everything they do represents, represents guests on their nerves. If you suddenly wake up and found yourself a lead character in Satyr's play, we would who would you find there? Hmm. Would it be someone at the other end of the political or social spectrum from where you stand? Would it be someone who talks too much or too little? Would it be your least favorite relative or your most dreaded school teacher? Hmm. Select your cast for a moment and then consider the challenge to find a common ground a sense of unity, even in the hottest room in hell. Affirming our inherent unity is possible, even when we cannot honestly force ourselves to like or to love or to understand everyone we meet. Huh, perhaps the truth makes the call to affirm unity all the more necessary as a foundation of faith. For when we dare to claim that the precious life that is in you and me is the same in all. We are articulating a theology of compassion. 
not a theology of settlement or even sympathy. Compassion requires that we recognize that we have a com what we have in common with our neighbors around the world. It's not necessary values or politics or preferences or philosophies. It teaches us to act on the basis of tolerance and the assumption of respect. It reminds us that we are relatives on a much more exist existential level. We share the fate of being born into this earthly existence, of learning to live and to love, and one day to die. We share the knowledge that this journey on is hard and joyful, heartbreaking and yet rewarding. And when we renounce this connection, we lose sight of one another's most basic humanity. When we forget one another's humanity, we begin to lose touch with any theology or truth that extends beyond the limits of our sight and our souls become much smaller. But beyond the Satans of our world, beyond the people who annoy or confound us, I believe there is another reason that we resist living as if the unity we espouse is real. This reason has nothing to do with conquering our less, our less admirable impulses and emotion, and it has everything to do with our fears of encompassing the immensity of it all. Perhaps like me, huh, you have been guilty of turning off all the news, I hope, because it is painful to feel the helplessness in the face of tragedy, both near and perhaps close by. Perhaps like me, you have heard saying, so you have heard yourself saying at one time or another when the mailbox is full of pleas. <laughs> I just can't be responsible for every important issue or every innocent person in need. There's not enough of me to go around. Well, perhaps like me, you can find yourself depressed under the seeming weight of the world. The affirmation of the unity which underlies all of creation can seem like an invitation to perpetual inadequacy. The price of love reaching out, which never seems to receive anything clear in return. But when such comments come, I try to regain my perspective. Can I really say that I have received nothing in return for my care and concerns for this wonderful world? Perhaps the love which comes back in, is not channeled on the 11 o'clock news, appearing in more quiet ways. The impact of a letter to the editor that may never make the front page. The loyalty of a friend who may never give their affection in words. The pink and orange of the sky at dawn, which comes no matter how sleepless the night we discount such gifts as, at our own peril. They are the signs and signals of the universe's strength and of its power to enable and, and to renew. In our moments of despair, we may feel too connected, when in truth we may not just be connected enough. When the early Unitarians declared that the concept of the Trinity was unbiblical, Hmm. They were also arguing that it was impractical. It diminishes the wholeness and power of God. Put in modern terms, the Reverend William Schultz has observed that Unitarian Universalism affirms that creation is too grand, too complex, and too mysterious to be captured in a narrow creed. Our religious task and challenge is to learn how to live in the face of all this grand and complex mystery. Clara Bateman reminds us, you too once were carried in your sleep. You too someone a warm weight of breath and cloth. Now we are encrusted with barbed gears, flinty, adamite, ready to repel that for the, the hint of honey, the trace of dawn, that secret nerve that never has grown numb. There is a debt between us even now that our autonomy cannot remove, a bent towards something more than tolerance, older than kindness, 
oddly akin to love. Our religious tradition has sought to tell, has sought to lift up in, us up in unity so that we might reclaim that secret nerve which has never grown numb, which has remained miraculously open to the odd kind of love. This is not a call to guilt or to despair, but a deep recognition that the circle of life is stronger as a whole than any one point along the way. We may in fact be as small and fragile in the grand scheme of things as an exclusive, exquisite butterfly or an exuberant toddler. Well, at times we may indeed be the cause of disastrous tornadoes, we could be. But at other times we may be the source of healing winds. If we do not remain open to at least the possibility of discovering and repaying that odd debt of love to an universe we did not create, but who holds us still, then we will never look far enough around us to know the difference. Yesterday I stood in the hay of a centennial farm and read the wedding ceremony of a young couple who are very much in love. I had just come from the shores of Lake Huron where I had helped to bury a man and woman who loved, much loved by their family whose marriage had spanned over 60 years. As the sun shone upon us and the couple had finished their vows, a butterfly landed beside them in the field. It stayed still, but for a moment before it continued on its way, I chose to take it as a good omen, a reminder of the interdependent web of which it is such a good to be a part of. We are children of the universe and we all have a right to be there. That is from the Siderata. I'm sure you're familiar with that. And each time I think about that, we all have a right to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mariana. Well, you might guess what our last hymn's going to be. <laughs> we would be one. What else can there be? So stand and sing if you're willing and able. We'll sing uh, the two verses.
If you have been blessed by this service, go and be a blessing to others. If you have felt love here, share that love with others in the world. If you have received inspiration in this service, go and be an inspiration to others. Blessed be, amen, and now the circle of life.